Hi folks, welcome to our weekly Bible study on Hebrews. We are going to start on chapter 7 tonight, but before we do so, let's pause and let's pray together. Lord, thank you again for another wonderful day. Lord, wonderful not because of the, the weather outside, but wonderful because it's a day that you have given to us, a day that you have blessed us, a day that you have been with us, and we thank you for that. Lord, you give us so much, including your word, and that's what we turn to now. We turn to your word to look at it, to see what it says to us, to see how it might challenge us or encourage us, how it would speak to us. Lord, we just ask that you would do that right now. Speak to us through your word, we pray, and help us to understand. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, we're on uh, Hebrews chapter 7 tonight. and um, Just let me read the first number of verses to you. Um, probably read down to about verse 7, and then we'll start to unpack these together and see what it has to say. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and the king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognised this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now the law of Moses required that the priests, who are descendants of Levi, must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. Let's pause there. We start to hear a little bit about Melchizedek. We don't hear all that much about him in the Old Testament. Um, we start to learn more about him now in the New Testament, which is interesting. But the writer of Hebrews wants to use him as an example um, and starts to talk a little bit about the history. So it tells us that he was the king of Salem and also the priest of God Most High. Even how the writer puts that, God Most High. Just showing that he's not just any priest of any sect, but he's the priest of the one and only God. Then we start to get into a little bit of history. All about Abraham coming back after winning a great battle against the kings, the, the, the enemies of Israel. And how as Abraham came back, he was met and he was blessed by Melchizedek. Now when you think about the priest, that's, and if you think about Abraham as well, it talked about how Abraham would be used to bless others, um, but anyone he cursed would be cursed. But also when you think about priests, if you think about the ironic blessing, um, that was the role of a priest, was to bless the people and to accept the offerings which were brought um, so that they would be acceptable unto God and to offer them to God. So it's interesting that this Melchizedek, who is king of Salem, but also a priest, that Abraham stops with him and that Abraham brings him a gift. It says Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. There's a tithe or a tenth, or whenever we think about what is appropriate for us to give to God, this is often used as an example of what is appropriate. If Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth, which was going to him as priest, not as king, um, then it's, it's a model of how we should tithe. Now, it, Abraham didn't take of his own possessions. He took of the things that had been captured in battle. That's what he had with him. And he gave of that. You know, there, there's lots of things that we can give a tenth of. We can give a tenth of wages that we receive. Um, if somebody were to give us a gift, we could give a tenth of a gift. 
Um, if we have time on our hands, we can give a tenth of our time. You know, there's, there's different ways that we can think of tithing. But the whole purpose of tithing was to give back, to say thank you, and then to support the ongoing work. Um, think about when people were first, whenever the, the Israelites fled from Egypt, um, and they had to bring um, gifts for the building of the temple, of the tabernacle. Um, how there was an outpouring of gifts at that time. And the outpouring was such, was so great, that Moses actually had to stop the gifts from coming. You know, we don't often see that in churches these days where our gifts are so overwhelming that somebody stands in front and goes, thank you for everything, we've got enough, please stop giving. Uh, we're more used to the other where we, we we're get up the front and say, actually, we need more. Or we're going to do a project and, and we're all, and you just give to a special project. Um, it's that whole idea of giving back uh, and how in giving back we are blessed. You know, it does talk about how um, Melchizedek blessed Abraham and that was after he'd given back a tenth. What's also interesting is the fact that we're given the meaning of the name. So Melchizedek means king of justice and the king of Salem means king of peace. You know, and those two things are linked, justice and peace. Um, when you think about Jesus and you think about God, Jesus wants to bring peace um, through the forgiveness of sins, but that also brings justice um, because there has to be an accountability for sin uh, and God is a just God and there, there has to be that. And then Jesus brings the peace or the grace of God and the blessing of God to us. So that's why Again, Melchizedek is used as a, a reflection of Christ, nearly, uh, as an example. It says that there's no record of his, that's Melchizedek's father or mother, or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. It's quite deliberate there, you know, just no beginning, no end. We think about God having no beginning or end. We think about how Jesus has been with God all that time. Even like think of John 14 says in the beginning was the word as Jesus and the word was with God and the word was God. Nothing was made without the word. So Jesus has that eternal aspect to him. So again, the writer is trying to introduce us to the qualities of Christ. I wonder how often we think about that, actually. You know, we think about God as being eternal. But how often do we actually pause and stop and think about the fact that all of God is eternal. So that's God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They've always been there. Um, in Genesis it talks about how the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit. You know, so we, we tend to forget sometimes about maybe that aspect of Christ and that aspect of the Holy Spirit. We forget how they are God's joined but separate. You know, we talk, we talk about Trinity. The word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. We use that. And we tend to forget some of those qualities of Christ. And it's good to remind ourselves of those. It's good to think about Christ's qualities, about who he is and what he is and what he has done for us. So it goes on to talk about Melchizedek. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham the great patriarch of Israel. So Abraham is a great leader. Abraham is seen as the father of Israel. Um, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and then leading into the tribe. So Abraham is the start. So that's why he's called the patriarch of Israel. Recognising his position, his rule, recognising the importance of him. And yet he gives a tenth of what he wins in battle to Melchizedek. Abraham is recognising someone who is greater than him. It says, now the law of Moses requires that the priests who are descendants of Levi must collect the tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. You have already um, the start of recognising that the high priest who is coming is not of the normal priestly order. He's not from the line of Levi. So if you understand um, the Old Testament, if you understand Jewish law, to be a, a, a priest, 
you had to be of the tribe of Levi to be able to serve. It was, it was so, even so strict that if you were not of the tribe of Levi and you went to church of the Ark of the Covenant, whenever it was being transported, even when it was covered and wrapped, you would die. It was only the Levites who could do this. Um, but Jesus is coming to be the new high priest, the perfect high priest, who is not from the line of Levi, but rather from the line of David. So Melchizedek again is seen as an image of the coming perfect high priest of Christ. And it talks about giving a tenth to Melchizedek. Uh, and Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. So the writer is saying that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. That's a big statement. For Certainly for any Jewish people reading this, um, that was a huge statement. To say that somebody was greater than Abraham, the father of their nation. And it just shows us that there's someone greater than us, who is Christ. Let's read on a little bit. The priests who collected tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the one who collected the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their, in, when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi was not born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body and Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. We have got the connection of um, acts that will happen and how they reflect back and how they reflect forward. That is reassuring for us in one way because, you know, people will say at times, well, what about the people who came before Christ? What about the people who died before then? How do we know that they have forgiveness of sins? If, if they relied on sacrifices and sacrifices didn't last, sacrifices were only temporary and whenever you sinned again, your sacrifice was broken. How do we know then that God will accept them uh, uh, and recognise them? And we have here how this offering of Abraham to Melchizedek is seen as an offering from the Levites who are yet to be born. And again, there's that recognition of the continuing love and cover of Christ and how the power of Christ stretches forwards and backwards. Um, that's an argument which is often put out about Old Testament about you know, well, will they die before Christ? How do we know that they are in heaven? Well, we know because of the promises of God. We know because God's grace is amazing. Um, and, and we don't decide it. That, that's the best. The, the ultimate thing is that, that we as humans don't decide who gets into heaven and who doesn't. Because we get it wrong every time. We're not perfect, whereas God is. So you start to see that continuing, ongoing promise or covenant and covenant theology is something that we are all about as Presbyterians the covenant or the promises of God God promised to bless Abraham and he did and you even see Melchizedek blessing him God promises that he'll be the father of all nations and he is likewise God promises the people of Israel that if they don't turn back to him that he will punish him and he does God promises one who is coming who through, through whom we have the forgiveness of sins. We see that in Jesus. But the promise is given in the Old Testament. So the promise or the covenant is there. And Melchizedek is a reflection, as I said, of that promise, of that covenant, of that perfect high priest. It's amazing to think of that, isn't it? Amazing to think of how, even from the beginning of time, Whenever Adam and Eve first sinned, there was a promise of forgiveness and a method of forgiveness. And that that promise is everlasting. And in that we see that promise borne out through Christ. Verse 11 says, So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood? with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron. 
And if the priesthood has changed, the law must also have changed to permit it. For the priests we are talking about belong to a different tribe, whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is, our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, there you have it, and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. You have there the mention of a new promise or a new covenant, a new order for priests. And if you think about what Jesus did whenever he broke bread um, with his disciples before his crucifixion, and he said that this was a new covenant in his blood, and that his body and that his blood was the new covenant, the new promise. We know that the sacrifices that all those priests would make cannot make us whole, cannot make us clean, never made the Jewish people clean. Even though the high priest went in every year and sprinkled the, the blood on the atonement site, it was a temporary measure. And we needed as people a permanent fix, a permanent resolution for our sins. And that is Christ. And that's what is being referred to here and reflected here. Our Lord came from the tribe of Judah. Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. A new priest, a perfect priest. There's so many priests in the Old Testament you read through. Are, they're wrong. They, they get things wrong. Um, uh, and their children who become priests get things wrong as well. And there's punishment. Uh, and, you know, we, we just see how flawed they are. It's not surprising because they're human beings like us. And we are just as flawed. So we know that we can't do things ourselves. That we need someone else. And that someone is Christ. So we start to see being led out for these um, listeners here, the, the, the whole idea of somebody different, somebody new. Maybe we don't connect with that the same again because we're removed by several thousand years. We're removed by the fact that we are not Jews. Um, we are Gentiles. We have a different relationship with God than what they did. We've never had the sacrifices, which they did in the, in the, in the temple. You know, it's, it is different for us. But that doesn't mean to say that we still can't appreciate what's going on. We still can't, we can appreciate the fact that God gives promises which are always there. And that God renews those promises for us. Just as he did through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And, and he gave them promises again and he renewed those promises with them. God renews the promise for us here by telling us about Christ. And we can claim that promise that he is our high priest. And that, that, he's the perfect high priest. You know, Melchizedek, yet yeah, was still a person. The imagery around him is a very good imagery about no beginning and no end, um, no death, um, the fact that he blessed Abraham. You know, that's, that's what God does for us through Christ. We are blessed. The question is, do you feel blessed? Do you feel honoured? Do you feel that special bond? Um, we all go through our ups and downs in life. We all have our trials and challenges. Uh, and at times we feel great, we feel so close to God. Other times we'll feel so far away. Just remember he's always there. Just remember he doesn't go away and he's always with us. Yes, he asks us to do different things. One of the challenges from that passage is about how we tithe, how we give. God doesn't ask us to give because he needs it. He asks us to give because it shows and it recognises um, who our God is. And for us, it recognises who everything comes from. So yes, you know, at times in church, we stand up and we say, we need, we, you know, we need money for this, that or the other. Uh, at the end of the day, God will provide and God does provide. But the challenge for us as Christians is, do we want to be involved in that work? Now, we can be, in, we can be involved really easily. We can give money. It's not complicated. It's not hard. We can give a tenth of what we have. That's easy. Possibly the bigger challenge comes in how do we give of ourselves as well? It's not just the money and the possessions that we have, but it's our time, our gifts, our talents that we have, those qualities about ourselves, using them for God, using them sacrificially. Take that challenge away with you. You know, if, if, if I were to come and knock on your door 
and I ask you to do something in church, what would your reaction be? Okay, at the minute, things are different. We're not meeting the same way. We're, we're you know, we, just, we can't because of COVID. But whenever things start back up again, whenever we need volunteers in church, if I were to knock on your door, what would the response be? If somebody else in church were to say to you, could, could you help out? Could you get involved? How would you respond? Would you feel that challenge that, yes, as a, as a follower of Christ, I need to be involved. I need to give back. Would it be a case of, oh, I'm too busy. Oh, I'm too old. Oh, I'm too young. Oh, I'm not experienced enough. Any of us can make those excuses. But what God asks us to do is to step out in faith trusting that he will be there to help us and to guide us and to grow us and to give us the strength that we need. You know, ask anybody who's got involved in something. The first year they've done it, maybe the first time they've done it, they were, they've been nervous, they've been frightened and scared. After that, they want to do it. There's a hunger to do it. There's a thirst to do it. Because it's wonderful just to see how you can help others but more importantly, how you can serve God. So yeah, take away that challenge about a tithe. It's easy to give up money and we do need to keep doing that. We need to keep giving in. But how about giving of, of time? How about giving of talent? How would that change your current relationship with God? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you again for the challenges that it brings to us. Thank you for the encouragement that Christ is our high priest, the perfect high priest, always with us. Lord, help us to examine ourselves as to how we give back to you. And Lord, please challenge us where we need challenged and help us to see what we can do and how we can do it. Father, thank you. Continue with, it now, with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for watching. Um, Take care, God bless, and see you again next week. Bye.